This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The bracket is set, and it is time to make some picks for the 2024 Men's College Basketball Tournament. We are here today to break down everything you need to know to fill out a hopefully winning bracket. We've got Dr. Ed Fang and Bennett Corcoran with us once again this year to break down their thoughts on strategy, pool selection, who they think will win the national championship, Final Four, upsets, and much more. We're going to break it all down today to get you ready for the 2024 tournament. This is covering the spread right here on the Fan to a podcast network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here once again by Dr. Ed Fang and Bennett Corker and our two guests for today to break down the 2024 Men's College Basketball Tournament. Dr. Ed Fang, you can find on Twitter at the Power Rank. Check out his work at thepowerrank.com and of course the author of How to Win Your NCAA Tournament Pool, the book which you can find over on Amazon. Ed, it is a pleasure to have you on for today. How you doing? I'm doing great. Excited about some more March Madness. Thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to chatting about it this hour. I was on Twitter last night and saw that uh, at thepowerrank.com, you've got some cool visualizations up for this year. We kind of like view the path of various teams. So stepping up your game, Ed, the data viz game is strong at the power rank right now. Thanks. Try my best. Absolutely. Our other guest here, as mentioned, is Bennett Corcoran of Shot Quality. You can find Bennett on Twitter at 617Bennett. Bennett has been with us on the show here the past couple of years. Does a lot of great work over at Shot Quality with uh, really fun data around college basketball. Uh, Bennett, it is a delight to give you back on the show today. How are you doing? I'm great, Jim. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, locked in and ready to dive into this bracket. So, I'm glad you could find time to chat with us, given you've been to, it sounds like, 70,000 or so college basketball games the past two weeks. You know, you're out there in New York, so easy access to a lot of different tournaments. So I'm glad you could find the time to sit down with us here for a bit. Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't miss it. So, All righty. Well, we're going to talk to you both Bennett and Ed to get their read on this year's tournament. We'll talk strategy, pool selection, everything you need to need to try to break down your bracket. We're doing a different order than a lot of people will do this kind of show because the most important thing for winning your bracket is picking the correct national champion because of how many points are allocated to that decision as a result of that we're going to spend the large part of our discussion focusing on exactly that trying to identify which team you should pick to win the national championship how that varies based on the size of your pool and much more so we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on that then we'll dive into the region by region breakdown talk about sleeper teams and stuff like that but the beginning part will be focusing on the national champion because it is so important to trying to win your pool. Also, a note on this week for the schedule here on Covering the Spread, we're talking tourney all the rest of this week. Tomorrow, we'll break down the women's side of things by talking to Justin Carter of Rotoballer, getting his read on the women's tournament. What do you think about South Carolina? Is he betting the field against South Carolina or laying the minus 145 with them? We'll talk to him about Iowa versus LSU potentially early on and a lot of other good stuff. That'll be up on the Covering the Spread podcast feed on Tuesday. Wednesday, we're going to have Riley Thomas of FanDuel Research on to break down his thoughts on Thursday's game. And then on Friday, we'll have Aiden Cotter on to break down his thoughts on all the Friday round of 64 men's games. So a lot of good stuff here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Just subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you you get your podcast if you like what you hear leave us a five star rating on apple Podcasts or spotify you can also find all these shows over on the fanduel youtube page and on fanduel tv plus Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or on a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com and bet in college hoops today until they cut down the nets. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 
or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777, or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Now, before we talk about this year's field, let's talk some strategy. And Ed, you wrote a book about how to win NCAA tournament pools. I've still got it here. It has survived five different apartment moves i think at this point a little little tattered but it's still it's still here and it's here for a reason Ed, because i gotta remind myself key things to know about contest selection and stuff like that so if you had your pick ed what kinds of pools are you deciding to join for the ncaa tournament thanks for still having that jim that's actually uh, i don't think those copies exist that i think i made those special one year I want to get it printed uh, somewhere if I can uh, find a grading, uh, someone to grade this to to see what if we can get a ten on this. Yeah, uh, I, I wish I had a copy because the yellow copy is the one that you can grab on Amazon. <laughs> when when you're thinking about a pool, like I mean, the first things first, like don't don't get in a huge pool, right? Your probability to win your pool decreases exponentially, and uh, you know exponential functions decay very rapidly. The ideal situation is a pool of about ten. You're probably going to end up something a little bit bigger, maybe 30, 50. We'll talk about strategy for that. But, you know, I mean, the simplest thing to do is to get in a really small pool and uh, pick a lot of favorites, pick a lot of chalk. Unfortunately, uh, not not unfortunately, not unfortunately for people listening, but unfortunately for me, there's a lot of betting people out there, pros that uh, continue to uh, give out sound advice on this X <laughs> cesspool of the Internet. Uh, which is really annoying to me. But, uh, you know, there's there's a guy out of China that I met a- in Boston at the Sloan Conference this year. And, um, you know, he, he was like, it's pretty simple. Just go with the market favorite in every game in the round of 32. <laughs> you know, pick pick the pick the team with a higher win probability every every other game. Just go with chalk. Um, and and that, that's basically your your best strategy for uh, for 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 a small pool. And, and that's you're going to be your best chance to win. So our, ideally, we're finding small pools, you know, 10 or so people. We can allow ourselves to use the betting markets as a guide, kind of take the chalk and allow ourselves to just pick the better teams and not get too funky. But the problem, Bennett, is that we can't always do that. You know, a lot of us are going to be stuck in work pools where there are a lot of people who are going to be in the in in these pools. And that's tough uh, because w- the larger the pool size is, the larger your incentive is to deviate. So let's say, Bennett, you are forced into a larger pool. How does that alter your approach to filling out a bracket? Yeah, I mean, I think with a larger pool, you definitely have to be a bit more contrarian. If you go with the all the favorites, you basically everything has to go right for you to ultimately win. Um, so how I like to think about it is more so can we come up with a little bit more contrarian pick for a champion? And then that way you still have like a higher margin of error. If you know, you miss on this one region or this one final four team doesn't work out for you. Um, you've built in this, you know, potential opportunity if this one team does happen to go on a run. So I do think you have to be careful. You don't be reckless. Obviously there's a fine line between being contrarian and just, you know, Let's put a bunch of double digit seeds sure. through. Um, as Ed said, definitely use the the betting markets as you know a guide. And now that betting has you know really taken off in terms of popularity, all the different markets that are being offered. We even have not just Final Four anymore, but like Sweet Sixteen, mm-hmm. um, you know, first round. So you can really leverage a lot of these different tools available to kind of help piece your bracket together. And I think that the key phrase I come back to is "be different without being dumb." And you can do that. It may sound ambitious, but it's very much possible to be different without being dumb. Now, Ed, when you're trying to do that, be different without being dumb, are you kind of taking the same approach as Bennett where you work backwards, 
find a slightly different national champion and kind of work from there if you're trying to differentiate in a larger pool? Absolutely. I mean, champions, as you mentioned, is is worth the most. Uh, that's where you can get the most edge. And what I do in my book is I actually quantify yeah. the effect of, of making these contrarian choices. It clearly depends on year. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on what the public is doing and those types of assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you you essentially want to kind of guess what people are doing in your pool and, and, and go against that in a larger pool. You know, an example I gave out in my newsletter uh, is, you know, if, you, if you're a Duke alum and you're in a pool with Duke alums, you can probably guess that more than half of the people in that pool are going to pick Duke. <laughs> so these are the type of pools that you want to get in. Duke is a fine basketball team, but I, I don't, I mean, they could, they could certainly win. Um, but the idea is, you know, process wise, you want to pick against the team that everyone else is picking. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll talk about the prohibitive favorite uh, soon. And, and that's what I would do if I were in that Duke pool. OK, so know your opponent, kind of know how they play things. If you're in a pool where people are more likely to take a certain team than they might be in other pools, take into take that into account. And public pick percentages may not be as indicative in those situations. So kind of always keep the context in mind when trying to play things out there. Now, you mentioned the prohibitive favor right now, Ed. That is Connecticut. They're down to plus 370 Jeez. to wow. win it all. And Ben, I want to begin with you here. UConn is plus 370. I talked to Ed about UConn last week, and he said they're a very well-rounded team. What's your assessment of UConn? Do you think they're worthy of this pretty optimistic number at FanDuel Sportsbook? And what's your view of them overall? Are you picking them to win if you're going with like kind of a like chalky bracket? Yeah, so UConn is, in my opinion, definitely a deserved favorite. Um, I think they are you know, the most talented, most complete team. Um, I think when you consider... Obviously, they won last year, but they lost, you know, considerable depth to the NBA and were able to just kind of retool and reload. I think defensively, the shooters that they have, and then also another impressive thing to me is the offensive rebounding to where if they're having an off night or an off half, they're still able to kind of generate a bunch of extra possessions and make it happen. Uh, this number at plus 370, it was a little bit farther out last night even yeah mm -hmm. uh was closer to like plus 400 or so so that tells you that people are kind of seeing what i'm seeing in terms of this team is very talented and could easily make it make it happen for the you know the first back-to-back -back champions since the gators back in the mid-2000s i my issue i guess is that when we were starting to get into this public pick percentage stuff i just think given that they won last year and given that they're the number one overall seed I'm anticipating a lot of people are going to take them. And I do think their region is particularly strong and we'll get into that a little bit later. So even though I do think they are a deserved favorite and kind of clearly the best team, I think in a smaller pool, you can maybe justify it. But I think in these larger pools, it's probably going to make sense to deviate plus 370. You're looking at like an implied win percentage around 20% or so 21%. Then you remove margin. It's a little bit less. And I mean, it's early, but so far we're seeing, you know, 26%, 30% type range, 26.1. Yeah. So I would, I mean, we'll kind of continue to closely monitor that. I think if that dips a little bit, it's easier to justify, but you know, where it is right now, it's probably not a ton of value taking UConn despite how good they are. Yeah, what Benno's referencing there is if you go to ESPN, they will list out the percentage of times each bracket that has been filled out has picked each team to win the national championship right now. UConn at 26.1% to win it all uh, based on the brackets has been filled out thus far over at Yahoo. As of last night, it was 32.2%. So even higher there. And as you mentioned, the implied odds at plus 370 are 21.3%. That's without accounting for hold. Uh, so the public is higher on UConn than the betting market is which can be a bit risky. So I don't want to talk to you. Are you picking UConn straight up to win it all? And how big of a pool do you need to be in before you decide to deviate elsewhere with them? I think UConn is the most complete team in the nation. I think they absolutely deserve to be the favorite. And uh, I think they have a really good chance of repeating. I think this team is, is that good. You can talk about players like Donovan Klingon, who is probably going to be a lottery pick, which seems really high for a seven foot two guy that doesn't shoot the three much. Tristan Newton is a really great point guard. Uh, I think the player that really shows why this program is so good is a, is a guy named Samson Johnson. 
comes off the bench. He basically backs up Klingon. And this is third or fourth year in the program. I think third. And this guy did nothing the previous two years. And now is like a legitimate backup, big, makes a contribution. They kind of call him Slamson Johnson because he, he gets a lot of dunks. I think Dan Hurley has like just a great program. I, I I'm kind of in awe of what he's been able to do. Uh, his story is, is kind of amazing. Obviously being Bobby Hurley's little brother, which can't be fun. He is Bob Hurley senior's son and Bob Hurley senior is just an absolute high school coaching legend. Uh, yeah. Dan Hurley is, is making it work and, and he's got a great program. So I love this UConn team. I, I fully believe in them. Uh, clearly the road is hard and, um, you know, I mean, they got smoked by Creighton this year, so it, it's not like it's for sure that, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to win the championship. I would feel very, very good about being in a small pool, picking chalk, having UConn as my champ. I think that's a, I think that's a very strong way to go. Okay. So Ed is on UConn in a small pool. Very okay with that. And Bennett sounded like in a small pool, he'd be willing to go that way as well, despite the fact they may be a bit overvalued in the betting market. So Bennett, let's scale things up. Larger pool. And you're like, okay, I think the public's too high on them. I want to deviate. Where do you turn first if you decide UConn will not be your pick in that larger pool? Yeah, so looking at the betting markets here, I mean, it seems pretty clear that there's kind of that second tier of teams, the other, you know, two of the other three one seeds in Houston and Purdue. And I think that's kind of the logical next place that I would look. Houston was, you know, my pick last year didn't exactly pan out, but I think, you know, it's, it's similar to UConn in the sense that it's a different team. They have some kind of key pieces back, but they were able to kind of reload and the system year over year is still, you know, intact. And I do think, you know, their region in terms of just like region strength is a little bit more favorable than UConn. Obviously UConn, we've kind of discussed the length already is I think a better team, but um, I think the path for Houston is a, a bit intriguing. They're 12% ish on that ESPN graphic that you showed. Purdue is considerably lower than that. And I do think there is kind of like the stigma with Purdue around, yeah, being the fourth selection here, but the third selection in the betting markets with like a pretty good gap between the odds. I think Purdue is kind of interesting. Obviously they lost in the first round last season, fairly Dickinson, the kind of stigma perception is that this team doesn't win in March. And I do think, you know, if you have the stunts to, to go back to the Purdue after maybe anticipating hopefully like a UVA type run 2019, <laughs> maybe you could, you know, circle them in. Um, but to me, like when you look at the kind of discrepancies between the odds that you were showing on FanDuel and what we're looking at here, Purdue kind of stands out um, a bit more than Houston does. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, Purdue right now, third best odds win it all, seven to one. There's a fall off after them down to Arizona, 13 to one. And in the public pick percentages, Purdue is at 8.7%. So betting markets much higher on Purdue than the public is as of right now, which could create some value there. So, Ed, where are you on Purdue and Houston? Like, let's say yeah. I tell you, you can't pick UConn for whatever reason. Who would be your preference between Houston and Purdue is that kind of number two option for you? I really like Houston. I love Calvin Sampson's program. I love the intensity with which they play defense. They are by far and away the best defensive team in the nation. I think they are by far and away the best defensive program in college basketball right now. You have teams like Tennessee and Virginia that, that also play great defense. I think, I think Houston is in a level above them um, with the way they get after it on that side of the ball. Now they do have problems. Uh, like they can't shoot the ball. That tends to be a problem. They tend to rely on offensive rebounds, uh, but they got smoked by Iowa state partially because Juwan Roberts didn't play that much. He is their big that gets on the glass. Uh, I think he was dinged up. So, you know, if they're going to miss shots and they can't have a guy like Roberts get the rebounds, they can get in trouble. Still with that said, uh, I mean, I need, I, I need to figure out a little bit more about exactly what's up with Roberts. I don't really think it matters probably until the second weekend, really. Um, but I think there's a, I think there's contrarian value in Houston. Um, my member numbers actually have their win probability north of 20%, uh, which certainly suggests value there. 
the numbers all like them. Um, I think no matter where you're going to look, I think UConn and Houston are going to be at the top. So I, I definitely do see some contrarian value there. Purdue is is an interesting team. I really love the way this team plays with uh, with kind of an unstoppable big and Zach Eady in the middle, and they have surrounded him with shooters, which is just great basketball to watch, in my opinion. I do have uh, you know I do have my concerns about them on the defensive side of the ball. They're they're roughly a top twenty defense, which is very good. Uh, obviously, Edie helps there back there with it, with his shot blocking ability. Um, but I'm not, I don't know how some of their wing players maybe hold up on the defensive side of the ball that, that would worry me. And I, I like Houston better. My numbers like Houston better. And, and I do think there's some contrarian value there with Houston. So you said your numbers have them above 20%. Would you consider betting Houston to win Ed? They're six to one right now, FanDuel sports, but obviously it's a very different situation than like being contrarian for a pool versus actually betting them. But any consideration to you for actually betting Houston out right here? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have a plus 900 ticket from earlier. Sweet. So, I mean, I'm not betting it again. Uh, if you don't, I would definitely consider it. I mean, I need to look again. I think Juwan Roberts really matters because this yeah. team is relying on offense rebounding. So I want to know what's going on there with that injury. Uh, but I, it's certainly something that interests me. Okay, Ben, let's go back to you here and talk about some dark horses. Any teams you have your eye on is maybe – Making a deep run at the tourney this year, potentially not to win the national championship. That might be a bit ambitious, but any dark horse teams you have got your eye on entering this tournament? Yeah, I mean, I think a dark horse team that I would consider in a larger pool to win would be potentially Arizona. So we're seeing here they're in the fourth spot. They are not the one seed in their region, but if you go over to the West region and you'll see the odds to win there, they are favored over North Carolina. So maybe not a dark horse when you kind of frame it that way, but their odds to win the region have been kind of trickling in as well, similar to what we were talking about with UConn. And I think kind of like what I was saying with Purdue, there might be a potential stigma around, oh, this team lost to Princeton in the first round last year. I'm not going to get burned again. And that might be creating you know a bit of value. Um, if you look at the ESPN pick percentages stuff, less than 5% of brackets so far are picking Arizona. It's super early, and I don't know that that'll necessarily hold up, but that seems like a fairly obvious spot to kind of pick. Like, I, th I think their odds, as we kind of reviewed with the sportsbook odds, definitively better than some of these other teams that have, are slotting in above them right now. So that's a situation that I'll kind of continue to monitor. But that's the kind of one team that I have keeping my eye on right now. Yeah, Arizona right now picked to win it all in 4.3% of ESPN brackets versus go to FanDuel Sportsbook and check out their odds for the national championship. They are at 13 to 1, as Bennett mentioned, shorter than North Carolina because Arizona is the favorite to win the West at FanDuel Sportsbook. Any dark horses you've got your eye on here, Ed? I'm keeping my eye on this Gonzaga team. This is a great program. Uh, this is a program that kind of has no right to be part of college basketball royalty, but they, they just continue to uh, produce pretty good teams. They're down from their peak uh, a couple years ago where, where they had some one and done NBA type talent. This is still a really good basketball team. They're 10th in my member numbers. So the, you know, I, I, I think it's a team that can go pretty far. You look at their region out in the Midwest, um, you know, Kansas is really banged up. That's going to be the five, four matchup. Uh, can't so they have a lot of injury issues and then the team after that they would play is Purdue who I certainly think is is vulnerable so you know I mean I think it's a team that I'm interested in Gonzaga is a team that my numbers really like and uh, I'll certainly be rooting for them to uh, to make a run all right so back on the Zags once again 50 to 1 to win the national championship over at FanDuel Sports if you want to get real crazy with it but to win the Midwest right now Gonzaga 10 to 1 that is the region with Purdue in it now we talked about the good end let's talk about some uh less fun things because the past couple of years we've had some one seeds that have fallen early on you had Purdue last year Bennett you alluded to UVA the year before they won the national championship they went down as a one seed Arizona last year went losing early so Bennett when you look at the high seeds in this year's tournament any of them stand out to you as being particularly shaky and potentially vulnerable to an early round upset yeah I mean I, I kind of alluded to this earlier with talking about Arizona but I think North Carolina in particular as far as the one seeds go, being kind of a tier below 
the other three, maybe a couple tiers below UConn. But I think they strike me as particularly vulnerable, not just because they're the worst of the four one seeds, but also kind of the draw. I do yeah. think, you know, either team that they would face in that second game, uh, Michigan State and Mississippi State, both grade fairly well across, you know, a lot of, you know, pick your analytics site. I'm sure Ed, your stuff will will also kind of align with this, but, you know, go on Ken Palm, shot quality, whatever. Uh, Michigan State ranks as like one of the higher, you know, eight, nine teams. A lot of people last night were, you know, kind of up in arms, you know, given their resume that maybe they didn't necessarily deserve to have a seed this high, but the numbers certainly back that up. And then Mississippi State, I mean, we just saw in the SEC tournament last week beating Tennessee. These teams can hang against, you know, really stiff competition. And I think UNC is a bit shaky. Um, the other top team I'm kind of keeping my eye on and a little bit wary of is Marquette. Uh, Marquette played really well in the Big East tournament last week, but, but you know, Tyler Kolek was the Big East player of the year last year and is definitively their best player. He's been out for the last couple of weeks. Sounds like it was kind of a precautionary thing and that they're going to let him go. But, you know, if you're not 100% sure what his status is and is he going to be, you know, 100% of himself, is he going to be 80% of himself? I think given that kind of uncertainty, I'd be wary of, you know, picking them to go to the Elite Eight or Final Four. Okay, so Marquette, given Bennett a little bit of the heebie-jeebies right here, and also UNC, the one seed in the West, potentially not a team he's looking to be super, super high on. What about for you, Ed? Are there any teams that you're wary of when it comes to the higher-seeded teams this year? For sure. I mean, I definitely agree with what Bennett is saying. I think this Marquette, it, it, team is pretty interesting. Tyler Kolek is an absolute stud, uh, completely runs that offense, is hyper efficient, great passer of the ball. And he, and he might not play, right? But the markets have Mar uh, Marquette as a 14 and a half point favorite. I'm making it at about 12. The market se certainly seems to think that Kolek's going to be back and uh, effective. That's what, that's what that means to me. I'm not sure that that's the case. Uh, so like, I mean, I, I completely, I completely agree there. Uh, I'm going to throw this out there just cause it's kind of fun. Um, you know, Auburn's a four seed in the East and I actually really love this team. They're really high in my numbers. They, uh, are fun to watch. They play hard. They play good defense. Uh, Janai Broom is a big that kind of does a lot on, on both ends of the floor. For me, they're an interesting team because they weren't in the preseason, uh, AP top 25, and those are always teams. So the preseason AP poll is a, is, a, is a very accurate predictor of tournament success. It harnesses the wisdom of crowds, and that tends to be a pretty good assessment of, of team strength. Uh, it isn't always perfect. You know, UConn last year was outside the top 25 before they made a run. I think you could see that coming a little bit more because UConn had multiple players that were going to play in the NBA. And I think we all knew that around November, December last year. And now there's three guys that are playing in the NBA. I'm not sure that's the same thing for the Zauburn team. Uh, I'm not sure any of those guys are going to be playing in the, in the NBA last year. They've really had a lot of success because Janai Broom has taken a big leap forward uh, since last season. Last season was his first year at Auburn. Uh, after coming transferring over from Moorhead State. Um, and then they have another big that, that's really taken a leap this year. It's an interesting team for me because I really like watching this team play. I think they are very efficient, um, but the preseason AP poll says there's probably not as much talent as we think. Uh, so th they're, they're an interesting team in that respect. Do they get upset? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Uh, Auburn, the four seed in the East, and that's a pretty tough region. So let's dive in now and talk about the East Regional and break it all down uh, and outline where Ben and Ed may be seeing some potential upsets there and their overall view of the region. Let's start things off at the top, though. UConn, the top overall seed. And as we discussed, in most situations, we're probably taking them to go pretty far in the tournament. Bennett, it's a tough bracket, though. So when you look at the East here, What's your view of, e of UConn? Are you taking them to go to the Final Four every time? Are you trying to deviate at times in larger pools? How are you handling UConn specifically in the East region? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think a lot of it, like you kind of alluded to, is subject to kind of, you know, bracket pool size. And I think in a smaller pool, it makes a lot of sense to just stick with the chalk and go with the best team, and that's UConn. 
as the odds clearly reflect. I think with if you're going to be in a larger pool or you want to deviate a little bit, the teams that I would consider are Auburn and Iowa State. I think if you go to Ken Palm right now, these are three of the top five teams on a site, which is pretty crazy that this is kind of how it shook out. We've seen, you know, traditionally the committee doesn't really necessarily – um, they're not necessarily swayed by championship <laughs> Saturday, championship Sunday. Yeah. And a lot of these t- times, these teams that ended up winning ended up kind of underseated and not necessarily rewarded for what they've done. And both those teams, you know, really rose to the occasion in their conference tournaments. Um, I, I do, I will push back a little bit on what Ed was saying about Auburn. I understand. I agree with the general premise that the preseason top 25 and kind of our prior heading into the season is a strong indicator of just like team talent and general success. And I do think those are teams that you should be looking to target. Um, But Auburn's first game, they actually played a, they played Baylor on a neutral and closed as a favorite. So I think just because it could have just been a miss by the preseason top 25. So I wouldn't let that necessarily, you you know, let you talk you out of Auburn. And I do think like Janai Broom, this is a really talented team. And if they were, you know, able to match up with say a UConn, um, I think, you know, Broom and Klingon would be just an unbelievable matchup and selfishly hoping we get there. So I would say if you're not going to go with UConn, I would go with, you know, either Iowa State, whose defense is really incredible, force a ton of turnovers. And that's something that I look for quite a bit. Obviously, you have to win, you know, six games. If you have an off night, you need to be able to generate great looks. And Iowa State's, you know, ability to just pressure the ball is unbelievable. So those are the two teams I would be looking at if you're not going to go with UConn. But again, I think in a smaller pool, you might as well just you know pick the best team. So, Yeah, Ed, with the Auburn thing, um, it's definitely interesting here because it sounds like from you watching them, it sounds like you want to like them. Um, so I'm curious, how do you view them when you look at just this East Regional? Do you think they've got the juice to contend with Connecticut here? Because it sounds like, again, you've liked them. So I'm curious what right. your what your thoughts are on them when we look at this East region specifically. Yeah, well, let's keep the back and forth going. Auburn's yeah. three-point defense has been exceptional this year. Um, so, and when you hold a team to under 30%, sorry, when you hold your opponents to under 30% from three on defense, it's usually unsustainable. Programs like Houston can do it. I'm actually looking at Auburn's numbers. Uh, it was actually pretty good last year as well. And Auburn and, you know, not as good, actually still pretty good the year before. So there's probably some regression due there. Uh, I don't know. Look, as far as this region goes, I think we could be sitting here in two weeks and being like, well, duh. I mean, of course, UConn was going to make the final <laughs> four. You had Auburn that was like outside of the top 25 and had this three-point defense. And then the other two teams that we're really talking about are Iowa State and Illinois and Maybe they're overseeded because they had some hot runs in their their tournaments. Uh, Iowa State had the advantage of not having drawn Roberts like to box out in that game, and they kind of fall back to earth a little bit. And then you know UConn just goes through. I I really believe in chalk in this region, and um, I would go with what I consider to be the most complete team in this tournament. Okay, so it sounds like both Ben and Ed are aligned here. Where. As long as you're in a small enough pool, you're taking UConn. It sounds like even in larger pools, we could consider UConn to the final four, but then deviate once you get later on. If you decide you want to dump them, dump them later, uh, despite the fact this is a very good region. Ben, I want to go back to you and talk about some lower seeded teams. Now, probably not going to topple UConn, but we're looking at like some surprise teams. Anyone you think could make a run at the Elite Eight, maybe not, you know, final four, but like Elite Eight in this bracket. Um, I don't know about Elite Eight just because of the, the teams at the top that we just highlighted are so strong, but a team I'm looking at to maybe win a couple games is BYU. So BYU is the strongest six seed in the bracket. And honestly, I think I believe the committee last night said they would have been a five, but then there was some scheduling stuff around not playing Sundays and they ended up with a six yeah. here, which also kind of just speaks to the strength of this region in general. But I think Duquesne... This is a team that got hot at the right time to make the tournament, but we're not projected to make noise in the A-10 tournament. And then Illinois, who just won their conference tournament, Terrence Shannon playing out of his mind, puts up you know, 30, 35 points a game in that three-game stretch to close that out. 
I just think if he has an off game, you know, they're very susceptible to potentially getting bounced. They really don't force any turnovers. So if, yeah, for whatever reason, he can't find a shot, I'm just a little concerned about Illinois. So BYU is just, you know, they're a very efficient shooting team and they do a good job in terms of the extra possessions game, not turning it over and doing all right on the glass. So I, you know, think you can consider them winning a couple games, but as far as like elite eight or final four, I think you just got to kind of stick at the top here with the best teams. Okay. So then it does like BYU to potentially win a couple games. They are the sixth seed out here in the East. Ed, what about you? Any lower seeded teams you think could uh, at least, you know, win a couple of games here in the East? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I kind of, I kind of like this BYU t- team as well. You know, I'm looking at my numbers. They're actually 17th in the numbers that I trust the most they take more than half their shots from three which isn't you know i mean which is kind of fun uh you know it's high variance but high variance is not always a bad thing it can be a good thing if you're trying to you know swing for a long shot right right so they're definitely a team that that is kind of interesting and maybe potentially makes this bracket um you know a little more interesting in the bottom Okay, that's BYU. So both Ben and Ed thinking BYU could be a fun team. As mentioned, we don't want to spend a lot of time in early round upsets because they're not going to get you the majority of the points, but they are fun to discuss. So Ben, any early round upsets you're checking out here in the East bracket? Um, I've got my eye on this Washington State Drake game as kind of an interesting one. I I also did the same thing with Drake last year and my end went to the final four. So big caveat, but I, um, I do really like this Drake team. They do bring a lot back from last season. Um, Tucker DeVries, their best player, probably going to end up playing in the NBA one day. And I do think this Washington state team just, you know, obviously they had a re- really good regular season, but I think, you know, the kind of a little bit more susceptible the last few weeks in terms of just, appearing to be a little bit more vulnerable. So I think, you know, maybe you're looking at 710. I think that if you look at the odds on FanDuel, it's pretty close to a pick so not Mm -hmm. necessarily really an upset. And these 710 and 89 games are fairly coin flippy. So maybe, you you know, you think most people are just going to take the higher seed and you go with Drake, who might, you know, provide a little value here. Oh, so we're actually favorite. Wow. So not an upset at all retract everything but well (laughs) i I think that it's important to note that though because um not everyone is going to use betting markets as the way to fill out their brackets now i will note that if you go over to espn um people are picking drake uh 53 to beat washington state in the first round but i do think it's still noteworthy because a lot of people listening probably don't watch a lot of college basketball, so may not know that Drake, in your eyes, is the better team. So I think it's still worth noting that even if the betting markets say it's not necessarily an upset. All right, so Bennett likes Drake, potentially in that first round, taking on Washington State, the 7 versus 10 matchup. Ed, anything for you as far as potential upsets go here? This is a... This Drake Washington State game is interesting because my numbers actually have Washington State by three in it. Um, I don't really have a beat on either team, but that certainly suggests some value potentially in in the, the team from the sadly now defunct Pac-12, right? All right. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, it, it's been interesting because the committee has gotten so be- – no, I don't want to say so good. They've gotten a lot better at seating and a lot of times – you know, a decade ago, you would often find double digit seeds that were actually favorites. Mm-hmm. And that's really evaporated over the last couple of years, except there are some. So we'll talk about those in the other regions. Okay, let's go now to the South region and discuss what we're seeing out there. Houston is a team that both of you were high on uh, as with regards to winning the national championship, in part because potentially their path wasn't as hard. We talked a bit about Marquette skepticism. So Bennett, when you look at Houston, are they the clear favorite to you to win this South region? They are to me. Yeah. I do think that they, the way that the kind of bracket broke, they just appear to be kind of a cut above all these other kind of top seeds. And then I I also do think because you get a lot of these brain brand name teams in this region. So like the Dukes and the Kentuckys that could, you know, potentially create even more value on Houston to advance the final four, just because this time of year, you know, you get people that aren't necessarily paying 
too close attention are just going to see the blue blood and put them through. So hopefully that's how it plays out and we can get, you know, some potential leverage here on Houston. But I do think that they are the deserved favorite. I echo everything Ed said earlier. I just think defensively, this is the best team in the country. And like they have laughable games where, you know, teams score, you know, struggle to put up 40 type thing. And I just think that team, you know, preparing on short notice to play that kind of defense is going to be a really tall order. So I, I do think they're absolutely, you know, the favorite in my opinion. If you look at Yahoo from last night, uh, 43% of brackets had Houston advancing to the final four. That's not super far off from the betting markets because they're plus 145 to win the South. Implied odds there are 40.8%. So not a huge gap there at all. So it sounds like public pretty correct on Houston, a.k.a. they're not super overvalued as things stand right now. What about for you, Ed? Is Houston the clear favorite here in the South? They are definitely my clear favorite. I'm, I'm actually looking at this right now and... Look, you have Marquette that probably doesn't have Tyler Kolick at 100%. Maybe he gets there by the time they see Houston. You have a Florida team whose center just broke his leg uh, yeah. in the conference tournament. Uh, apparently, it was pretty gruesome. Yeah. You have a team like Kentucky who is just just has all the talent in the world, right? I mean, if you're playing pickup ball, like you you are you are getting got you know if you're picking a team, you're like I want Rob Dillingham, right? And like this that Viero kid that looks like Looks like about as thick as LeBron James. Uh, they unfortunately don't play much defense. And uh, yeah, John Calipari used to be like a coach that could get some of these one and done type guys to to really uh, care about the defensive side of the ball. This doesn't seem to be one of those teams. Um, I, I don't think they're going to get particularly far, even though they do have the talent to make it there. Duke is uh, a lot of the same story. A lot of blue chip guys uh, like Kyle Filiposki, who who I do think is pretty good. Um, they're also it just doesn't seem like they th their defensive numbers are a lot better than Kentucky's, but just not like just not a team that I feel makes it that far despite their talent. So kind of when you put that all together, like I like Houston, uh, obviously. A uh, little caveat, you know, a little bit of a warning because of the Juwan Roberts potential injury not being 100%, but the region looks pretty good. Okay. And Ed, it sounds like similar to UConn, you're okay taking Houston to the Final Four, even in larger pools. Am I interpreting that correctly? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. I so feel, we, I, I mean, these two regions, I feel really, really good about the top two seeds. Same for you, Bennett, where you're okay taking Houston, even if it's a bit of a larger pool? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about some lower seeded teams here in the South. Ben, when you're looking at teams with higher seeds, maybe not pushing Houston, obviously, but who could win a game or two, similar to what you were saying with BYU before, which teams stand out to you there? Um, so Edward just kind of alluded to Florida a little bit as a team that Micah Hadlington just broke his leg and really, really sad. And I hope that, you know, everything's okay. Yeah. But I think given their kind of profile, they're still, you know, potentially could win a couple games. I think they still do, even with the loss of Micah, they still have, you know, some strong interior players. Alex Condon's really come on. Tyree Samuel transferred from Seton Hall's had a really good year. I think they could potentially you know, put, put a couple games together here and make a run, especially if, you know, Colex injury is still kind of really bothering him. So they're a team I kind of have circled. Um, other than that, though, I mean, I, I do think I'm not really as into some of the lower seeded teams in this region. So I think they're the kind of one clear team that I'm circling. But I would say, yeah, some of the other kind of double digit seeds, I don't really have a ton of confidence in. Florida, the seven seed here in the South, uh, they will face the winner between um, Colorado and Boise State during the play-in games earlier on this week. Ed, what about for you? Any lower-seeded teams you think could make some damage or make some noise here in the South? I think Colorado is interesting. I have them at about a three-point favorite to beat Boise State. They're actually 25th in, in my numbers. They made a late run uh, in, the, in the Pac-12 tournament, and they also have a bunch of NBA-caliber guys on that team. It's it's honestly a roster that kind of makes you wonder why they're not better. 
Um, so if any kind of double digit seed uh, is interesting in this region, I would definitely go with Colorado. Okay, and again, Colorado is uh, facing off against Boise State, and Ed has them as a three-point favorite in that one. Should they win, could potentially be a threat against Florida, so that 10 versus 7 matchup could be pretty fun. Out here in the South, Ed, any early round upsets you're eyeing here in the South Regional? Uh, I mean, prob- probably just, just Colorado. Yeah. I mean, maybe, you know, through... I don't know. I mean, that's an you know, it's a it's an injury riddled part of the bracket. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, over I know, ten, ten, ten over seven is not exactly the most exciting thing, but uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, although this is like like you said, an injury riddled part of the bracket. I think Colorado was a team that was injury riddled throughout the season, and are now potentially underseeded because of that. Like Trisha De Silva, Cody Williams, these guys missing time, and now, like you alluded to, Ed, kind of getting healthy at the right time and making a run in the Pac-12 tournament. So they're definitely another team if they're able to win the play-in game that you can at least consider most of these bracket pools aren't necessarily going to lock until thursday so you can kind of move accordingly Uh, but that's you know definitely echo that and team to watch for sure any other uh potential first round upsets you're eyeing here bennett um i think that's probably it for me i i do think this texas tech team is a little vulnerable and i was looking to see what the draw would be i'm not super thrilled about the nc state matchup but I mean, I just think Texas Tech is, you know, a bit overachieved relative to their talent level in the Big 12. And they've had some injury stuff as well with like Warren Washington is kind of the glue guy who has been out for the last half dozen games or so. So I was kind of trying to keep an eye on, you know, maybe they'll get a, you know, enticing matchup. I'm not sure that NC State after winning, geez, I think it was what, four or five, five games, games in, in five days. Five games days. Five yeah. So I don't know if there's a lot of gas in the, t- the tank left for NC state to kind of keep it going, but that was when I also kind of had my eye on and it's only a four point line, I believe. So, you know, that's one of those where maybe you take a look at the pick percentages and if like 20% of people are picking NC state, sure. you know, you can maybe extract some value there. Well, the heart wants more DJ Burns, so selfishly going right. to root for NC oh, State. Yeah. <laughs> uh, selfishly going to be doing that uh, in this South region. Okay, so largely chalk, it sounds like, in the South, uh, and then using the other regions to deviate. Let's talk now about the Midwest. Pretty interesting region here as well right now. Purdue is a favorite at plus 165. Pretty deep region, Ed. Uh, what's your top-level view of the Midwest with Purdue as a favorite right now? I, I think Tennessee should be favored here. My numbers really like Tennessee. They are a, uh, a, a top. I mean, they're an elite defensive team. Uh, they have been for the past five years uh, under Rick Barnes. And now they have Dalton connect, who is a great story. A uh, kid that was playing in Juco as of two, two years and a couple months ago. And now is potentially a lottery pick in the NBA. He's six foot six. He's, he's strong, athletic, um, has just put up massive numbers in, in the SEC this uh, this year. And he's legit. He's really legit. And I think a lot of these teams are going to have a, a problem stopping him. Tennessee has been this program that has always been good, and they rely on the defensive side of the ball. But now all of a sudden they got an alpha that can just straight up put it in the bucket. Uh, I think that makes them interesting. You know, my, my member numbers actually have – Tennis, I'm pretty sure they have Tennessee ahead of Purdue. Um, they're neck and neck. Okay. Tennessee was ahead of them uh, before falling in, in the SEC tournament. So uh, I, I really like this Tennessee th- team. I think they're legit, and um, I would I would make them the favorite in this region. All right. So Tennessee right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, plus 360 to win the Midwest. If you look at the uh, Yahoo – Public pick numbers, Purdue going to the final four and 40% of brackets versus Tennessee down just 21%. So Bennett, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, what are you doing with the Midwest here? Are you as high in Tennessee as Ed, or are you looking elsewhere to potentially topple Purdue? I would say not quite as high as Ed on Tennessee, but I still really do agree with all the points that he made around how strong they are and kind of the, the difference between this Tennessee team and all the other Tennessee teams that you picked to go to the final four that didn't go. <laughs> I, yeah, so I still think Purdue should be the favorite, but I think Tennessee definitely worthy second option. And I think I also just basically the way the, the bracket broke, I think their path is also enticing to me. Whereas, you know, Purdue, 
we were talking about Gonzaga a little bit earlier. Uh, it wouldn't be a you know a bracket show with Chin and Ed if I didn't talk about how much I like Gonzaga. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm already <laughs> I'm already back to um, you know circling that potential matchup and seeing what you know is is Gonzaga able to kind of make a move. But I think Tennessee definitely you know a worthy selection if you're trying to deviate a bit. I have some concerns about some of the other top seeded teams like. We alluded to Kansas having some injury stuff. Um, Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McCullough both sat out the Big 12 tournament. I would expect that it was kind of a precautionary move, but this team does not have a ton of depth. So for them to be missing one of their, you know, all-American type guys is obviously concerning. And then with Creighton, I mean, they're such an elite shot-making team, but they're so poor at generating extra possessions. If the shots aren't falling, I just feel like that's, you know, potentially a problem. They're dead last in the country at forcing turnovers and they have a below average offensive rebound rate. So that usually is not necessarily like they could hundred percent get hot and win six games. We talked about how they beat UConn their best game, you know, is up there with everyone, but can they do that? You know, game after game after game, I'm a little less sold. So I would say, if you're going to go, you know, with the chalk, Purdue or Tennessee are definitely viable. And I, you know, I would shy away from, you know, some of these other teams like Creighton or KU. You were talking about Kansas with their injuries. Uh, they, <clears throat> the betting markets reacted harshly to that uh, matchup against uh, Cincinnati where they closed as like, they were at two and a half point dogs uh, the morning of that game. And then they lost by 20. So to back up your point about a lack of depth, if there are any injury concerns there, probably not going to go super great for Kansas. They're the four seed taking on Samford in the first round. So uh, both Ed and Bennett see some shakiness potentially with Purdue. Tennessee is where Ed is going. Uh, Bennett does see some viability with Tennessee as well. Ben, I'll stick with you here and talk about some higher seats. Any higher seats you think could win a couple of games here in the Midwest? Yeah, so I'm taking a look at Oregon. They won the Pac-12 tournament. They drew South Carolina in the first round. This is one of those close to a pick'em games. Yeah, where we get a six versus eleven, and it's like a one point line. I think South Carolina is just a team that I think is a bit vulnerable. I would, I think it's eleven or so of their wins this year are six points or less. So they do play pretty slow. So that kind of might be part of the reason, but I do think, you know, the end of game variance has gone very well for them and they're probably a little bit overseeded as a result. If you look at, you know, most of these metrics have this team closer to like the forties as opposed to, you know, a top fringe top 25 team that's worthy of a six seed. So I do think Oregon, you know, could potentially pull the upset there and then, you know, you get a Creighton team where I kind of outlined some of the concerns. I don't know if I would pick Oregon to win two games, but um, I think, you know, they can at least, they'll at least, you know, have, have a decent chance, I guess, to get to the second weekend. And they're definitely a team I've have circled. So you alluded to the betting markets uh, for that first matchup. Oregon is basically right there with South Carolina. They're at minus 102 on the money line. That was minus 104 earlier this morning. So been a bit of a buyback on South Carolina, uh, but not much. So pretty much a pick between the 6 and 11 matchup here in the Midwest. Ed, what about for you? Any lower-seeded teams you think can make a run here in the Midwest? I, I love this region because I actually get to talk about a team with <laughs> double-digit seed higher than 10 that my numbers like and yeah my numbers like have oregon by a point over south carolina so that's that's very exciting right um uh yeah so that I, I do have I, I do have oregon i do think they can yeah i mean you know they're gonna be favored they should be favored in that first game and yeah we'll see how they do past that you guys were talking about kansas i do want to make the point there's there's like a difference between mcculler who has had a knee thing, been in and out of the lineup. I certainly think he plays. He's actually been effective uh, at some point over the last month while he's been dealing with this. Hunter Dickinson dislocated his shoulder. That seems bad. <laughs> that seems like not a thing you come back from within a week and are 100%. So he may go out there and play, but I'm just not sure how effective he's going to be. Um, you know, my numbers, which somewhat adjust for – for injuries like actually 
uh, are pretty much right on the market. Kansas, uh, seven and a half point favorite in this game. I, I just don't know if we can expect a guy to come back from a dislocated shoulder in a week. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe we need some medical experts uh, on the show to to talk about that. But it, it's definitely a concern if you're a Kansas fan. Yeah, that spread seven and a half right now for Kansas versus Samford. That is the first round matchup. Kansas, the four seed, Samford, the 13 seed there. So potentially some volatility. Keep close tabs in the injury situation for Kansas. Get a read on if if they'll be good to go and how close they'll be to full health. And, you know, we can't pivot our brackets, unfortunately, later on the tournament. But if you get a read that he's not fully healthy, maybe it's the spot where you're betting against Kansas in later rounds for individual game stuff. Let's wrap up here and talk about the West. Well, right now, things are pretty interesting because although UNC is the one seed, it is Arizona who is a favorite. They are plus 230 to win the West, whereas North Carolina is at plus 380. So, Ed, who you got? UNC or Arizona as a favorite here in the in the West? My numbers really like Arizona over North Carolina. North Carolina has been a really good team this year. They've really made some advances on the defensive side of the ball. And anytime a team can go into Cameron Indoor Stadium and kind of bully Duke around and win a game, that's certainly really impressive. Uh, but my numbers don't particularly like this team overall. Like I actually have them 11th in my member numbers over, uh, I mean, behind Gonzaga. Uh, Arizona is a really good basketball team. I have them fifth. They're top five team. They're actually top five in both. Uh, offensive and defensive efficiency. It's not like I don't love this Arizona team, but I certainly think they have all the the type of tools that you need to make a pretty deep run. Um, you know, for example, like Caleb Love, I, I think he's a good player. I don't think he's an elite player, but on this team, I, I think they have enough. Like, I think it works well enough that they should, I, they definitely deserve to be the favorite here. Um, you also have to think about travel. This regional final is in Los Angeles, and that's not very far for all these Arizona fans to come. North Carolina is going all the way across the country, uh, and you can imagine a situation where they go to Los Angeles and have to play uh, St. Mary's, who's just coming down the the pike in, in California to, to play that game. St. Mary's is a very good team, by the way. Always been a big fan of Randy Bennett's program there. And then you have to play Arizona. Um I don't know. I mean, the committee didn't do <laughs> didn't do them any favors here, like putting them out west. Whoop de do. You get a one seed, but um, I don't know. Like, would, would would you rather? I don't know. Maybe you'd rather be the the two seed in the Midwest or something like that. All right. So Ed is saying that Arizona should be the favorite here in part due to travel, but also because Arizona is a good basketball team. And Bennett, you mentioned Arizona is like a team you liked as a contrarian national champion. So I have to assume you're probably on board of Arizona to win the East, the, the West as well. Yeah, I actually already bet Arizona to win the region. <laughs> so I'm, What'd you I'm get in, it at? So I got plus 250. Okay. I think 230, there's still probably a little bit of value. Okay. Um, but I, yeah, I still think Arizona's, I think not only are they better than North Carolina, which Ed seems to agree with, but I also just think that the path for them is a little bit easier. Even looking at like sweet 16 probability, like North Carolina, I said this eight, nine game, you know, could be very, very tricky depending on, I honestly, I think either team could give North Carolina a really good game. I don't know which, and that's the, always the tricky part with the brackets is, you know, right. You you don't get points if you get the eight nine game Correct. wrong, so <laughs> you just miss out on I, points than everyone else if you get it wrong. Yeah, sure, exactly. So, but I do think like, and that's part of why I went and just bet them they'll win the region. I think the the seven ten matchup, um, Dayton and Nevada. I, I think both those teams are you know potentially a little bit um, over seeded. Um, Dayton you know really struggled to finish the year, and I think they were kind of more so just. You know, you do these bracket reveals in like February and they're on like the four or five line. And I think they were kind of coasting off that a little bit despite kind of struggling to finish the season off. And then, yeah, so I think, you know, feel good about Arizona beating either of those teams. And then, you know, potentially, obviously, there's some interesting teams kind of right above that with, you know, Baylor, New Mexico, Clemson. But I still think Arizona's path and then also just kind of like quality of team. 
they seem like the the pick to me so Okay, so both Ed and Bennett are on Arizona. They're the betting favorites in the West, and they concur. Arizona should be the favorite for your brackets as well. Ben, is sticking with you. Any lower-seeded teams you think can make a run here in this West Regional? Oh, man. my uh, Any of my buddies that are watching are going to laugh right now because I've been talking about this Grand Canyon team for like five months. Oh, <laughs> let's go. And, um, yeah, here we go, the Lopes. I, I was – Hoping that, you know, they might get a, a little bit more favorable of a draw. St. Mary is obviously a fairly good team, but I still think that there's a chance that they can win this game. Um, the, obviously, we talked a little bit about the the kind of travel of it all and, you know, being a West Coast mid-major. It doesn't always work out that way with the mid-major schools. Sometimes you have to go, you know, cross-country. But this team, you know, Bryce Drew, high-level coach, Tyon Grant Foster, their best player, was – you know, started at Kansas and was very highly regarded out of high school. It's not usually the profile you see from like a whack team. And I just think this team is a lot of fun and they could potentially make a move if they were to win, which is obviously a big, if Alabama is very much live by the three, die by the three. So, you know, you catch them on an off night, their shooting splits away from home are considerably worse than at home. So, you know, it wouldn't shock me if they, you know, just, you know, had an off game and the winner of this 5-12 game was able to take them down. So that's a team I'm definitely looking at, um, the Lopes. So love it. Grand Canyon, the 12 seed taking on St. Mary's in the first round if they were to win, would face either Alabama or College of Charleston. And variance is good when you're an underdog. Variance not always your friend when you are a favorite, which is what Alabama would likely be in that game if they were to face uh, Grand Canyon. So Bennett is on them as the 12 seed out here in the West. And you mentioned travel for UNC. That's applicable for Alabama as well as I head out to the West. Ed, what about for you? Any lower seeded teams you have your eye on out here in the West? Again, this is very exciting because I actually have an 11 seed that as a three-point favorite. I have New Mexico as a three-point favorite over Clemson. Uh, so, uh, yeah, upset city, right? It's fun Love when it. the upsets are chalk, um, by the markets as well. Uh, I think last I checked, New Mexico was a one and a half point favorite there. So, they still uh, are, yep. yeah, so that's the team. I'm not, I'm not really up on the New Mexico team, but, but it, it is one, um, that, that my number suggests can make a run. And then, you know, also like, you know, I have Michigan state rank and Mississippi state rank pretty high. I have them as a pick. I'm 28th and 29th. And so that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, th that's pretty, pretty good for an eight and a nine seed. Right. No, no, actually that's oh, roughly yeah. about right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go back to, to what I said about New Mexico. Yeah. Okay. So that. New Mexico, the 11 seed taking on Clemson, as Ed mentioned, they are slight favorites in this game. Uh, New Mexico's money line minus one Oh two taking on Clemson. So again, Put stock in the betting markets because even though it's six versus 11, not necessarily an upset in the betting market wise, but uh, potentially one where not a lot of people will be uh, as in tune to that as they potentially should be. If we go over to ESPN right now and check out what they have, it does confirm that because at least as of last update, Clemson was picked to beat New Mexico in 55% of brackets. So the market is saying pick New Mexico. The public is taking Clemson right now. So take a look at New Mexico as potentially an early round upset out here in the West. Want to give both of you one final shot to pass out any final, any final thoughts, any final strategy tips, anything else you're thinking about here. Bennett, let's start with you. Any final words for you on this 2024 men's NCAA tournament before we close up shop for today? Yeah, no, I mean, I think ultimately UConn is the best team and they certainly have the most talent, which was just saw them play a bunch of the Big East tournament, and it's hard to walk away from that and think anything else. But I think, you know, as we're kind of looking at, and I do think, you know, smaller pools, whatever, that's justifiable. But I, I do think in terms of, you know, closely monitor these public pay percentages and see if we can extract value elsewhere in larger pools or if their pick percentage comes down a, a little bit, you know, maybe that's the direction that we end up going. We were kind of alluding to this earlier with like the ESPN who picked whom is defunct or no longer no longer with us. So I would check out Yahoo, closely monitor that, see if those numbers are updating and, you know, use that as kind of like your frame of reference to get a sense of what other people are doing. But I think that's going to ultimately dictate, you know, what direction I go 
in terms of champion, but I think particularly, yeah, UConn, or if you want to deviate, I would say Houston is kind of the, the next logical choice. Uh, but the, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there and kick it to, to you guys. All right, Ed, what, any final words of wisdom from you? My approach for kind of filling out the bracket would be, so not necessarily just to look at my numbers, but to look at a variety of sources. Uh, I started looking at what the market said last year. And this year, I'm also going to look at what is happening in the preseason AP poll. So kind of look at an ensemble of those three things. That's a lot of work for you, obviously. Um, but that's actually what I'm doing for people in my bracket advice. So you can check that out at thepowerrank.com. I should have that up by tomorrow noon-ish. That's my goal, at least. Um, but, you know, I think, like, in those early rounds, they don't matter much, but you can probably get a little bit of a slight edge by just kind of putting an ensemble of those things yeah. together. Uh, and that's what that's what I'll be doing for my customers this year. Wisdom And, of the and you can do it yourself. It's just yeah, annoying amount of work. <laughs> Wisdom of the crowds has been something we've harped on for the entirety of this, this show's run. Um, and it's something that can always be good. Pooling together multiple smart uh, sources of information is going to get you a better outcome, which is why I have you two on every year. So I can hear both of you hear what you had to say and help me fill out a better bracket because I would be lost without you guys. Now, Ed, you alluded to your member numbers. You got the Bracket Wisdom podcast here is going on as well over the Football Analytics Show. What all can people find over at the Power Rank and the Football Analytics Show throughout this massive, massive week? Right. I mean, I think the easiest thing to do uh, is I'll do some of the work for you, right? I mean, if, if you just look at my college basketball team rankings, the higher ranked team has won almost 70% of games. And you can go do that work by looking at my college basketball team rankings. But it's just easier to sign up for my free email newsletter and I'll do it for you and I'll send it to you on Wednesday. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. It's a, it's a nice free way to get engaged with the stuff I do. And, um, and then you also get Five Nugget Saturday, which uh, I've been putting a lot of college basketball player props in there. That has been fun. Uh, I'm really interested to see what these Dalton Connect uh, points uh, markets look like in this tournament. That should be pretty interesting um, as we go forward. But uh, yeah, just check that out at thepowerrank.com. It's easy. It's just like a cheat sheet. You fill out your bracket and then you're on your way. All right. You can find the podcast as well by searching for the Football Analytics Show. Find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank and find his work at thepowerrank.com. Bennett, I saw the shot quality. has got some good stuff going up. So if people want to check that out, where can they go to find all the fun stuff that shot quality is doing for this year's tournament? Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of kind of bracket tools, matchup stuff over at Shot Quality Bets. And if you're in a live betting, uh, we've been doing a lot more stuff recently within the last few months or so where we have different tools basically saying this is how many points this team has or points per possession, but based on, you know, the shot profile and what we would expect, this is what they've actually, um, you know, here's expectation versus the kind of reality and, you know, what teams might be looking to, you know, positively or negatively regress throughout the course of a game. So it's kind of an interesting tool to have up if, if you're watching all these games at once and want a little bit more action so I would definitely recommend that. We've been doing some live streams around that stuff as well. So if if that's something that sounds fun to you, which I mean, I'll, I'll definitely be, uh, you know, having a bunch of screens up and that'll be one of them. So <laughs> I love it. All righty. So check that out. Uh, if, check out uh, Bennett on Twitter at 617 Bennett to find that. Bennett, appreciate you as always. Ed, uh, same to you. Uh, just great to have both you guys on the show here to get your thoughts on this year's tournament. As a reminder, much more stuff coming up here on covering the spread throughout this week to get you ready for all that is to occur. Across this week, we are talking to Justin Carter of Rotoballer, getting his read on the women's bracket tomorrow here on the show. And then we'll have individual day breakdowns for Thursday and Friday coming up on the covering the spread podcast feed the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV plus I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis so you can check out FanDuel research on Twitter at FanDuel research and again find the show on FanDuel TV plus and the FanDuel YouTube page I want to thank you all for tuning in good luck to you with your brackets this year we'll talk to you all again soon this has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network 